I'm Elise Hugh. And I'm Josh Klein. And we're the hosts of Built for Change, a podcast from Accenture. On Built for Change, we're talking to business leaders from every corner of the world that are harnessing change to reinvent the future of their business. We're discussing ideas like the importance of ethical AI or how productivity soars when companies truly listen to what their employees value. These are insights that leaders need to know to stay ahead. So subscribe to Built for Change wherever you get your podcasts. If you like listening to Warriors in Their Own Words, check out our other show, the Medal of Honor podcast. The link is in the show description. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words. In partnership with The Honor Project, we've brought this podcast back at a time when our nation needs these stories more than ever. Warriors in Their Own Words is our attempt to present an unvarnished, unsanitized truth of what we have asked of those who defend this nation. Thank you for listening, and by doing so, honoring those who have served. Today, we'll hear from Colonel Leo Thorsness. Thorsness served as a fighter pilot in Vietnam. He was awarded the Medal of Honor for saving his wingman's life and was a prisoner of war for six years after being shot down. The concept obviously was this was the first war in which there were surface to air missiles. So we, the United States, our military industrial complex came up with a concept of let's develop a missile that will home in on the radar, because the missiles that they fired us were radar control. Let's see if we can figure out, find a missile that will destroy that radar, and then let's put a system together and put an electronic warfare officer in the backseat of a, of a fighter, a two-place fighter, and have that pilot to, you know, do the maneuver, and the, and the warfare officer, you know, define this, refine all this technical data, and see if we can't find an aiming system where we can destroy those surface-to-air missiles, either on the ground or figure out how to evade the SAMs once they're launched at this first in-group, the wild weasels, and then we'll go destroy the, the radar after that in the, in the launch vehicles. And so um, it was just another step in warfare. We're a first-time weapon. Now we got to come up with a, with a defense to it. Just like World War II or Korea, there were bridges, there was POL, there were supply lines, railroad tracks, uh, those kinds of hard targets. And uh, that was the strike force, the, the flights of four airplanes coming in with their big bombs. And our job was to go in just ahead of them and, again, hold down the surface air missile sites or destroy them and let those people do their job of interdiction and destroying their fuel supplies, rail lines, and those things. We as well, the weasels, were tasked with the job of going in ahead of the people carrying the iron bomb, the strike flight, and eliminate the surface air missile threat to them. And they had to deal with MiGs and, and flak, but we were supposed to eliminate that, that threat. The best way to find a SAM site, after we'd been there a little while and they got used to what we were doing, you'd turn into them and get ready to launch a strike at them, our missile, they'd turn, turn, their, turn their site off, turn away, they come back up. And there were enough of them where they kind of kept you going. You were bouncing between them, and eventually you get, they pulled you in or sucked you into the strike vice and the hedge. So um, the way we uh, decided to do it was we would just figure out how to evade the missiles, let them shoot at us. And we'd troll in you know, 15, 18,000 feet, uh, somewhere in there, and we just kind of trolled around in there while these guys were coming in, hitting the targets and leaving. And uh, eventually they thought they had us in a position to, uh, to launch a missile and get us, and they'd launch a missile. And as soon as... We'd know. We'd hear the launch. That we had the equipment to know that they'd launched, and so uh, I'd, I'd immediately turn so that missile was somewhere on my one one side or the other, nine airplanes, and roll the airplane inverted and just call the flight and say, "Take her down." And that became the common statement: "Take it down, take it down." And you'd point that airplane at the ground and plug it and burn it and go as fast as you could, and you'd pull out before you hit the ground <laughs> with not a lot to spare, and and you'd start pulling and you'd pull it with a lot of G's and you'd have all this airspeed so you could. Well, the missiles they would come swing down and they'd have to arc down trying to get you, and they couldn't make the corner with you, and so the first one you, you start pulling and you wait the last minute so, and they were traveling um, a mile every two seconds, three thousand feet per second, and um, so you'd pull and they couldn't quite make it. Pull the next one would be here and they usually fought, fired three at, at uh, six second intervals. And so you knew kind of what's, had they figured out to, and delayed that last one 18 seconds or 20 seconds, they had gotten a lot of us. Because that last one, you're up here 
run out of airspeed. We didn't have the airplanes of today. You could go fast, but they didn't have that much thrust. And you're up here, not very maneuverable. But we'd troll around back and forth, and we'd sucker them into firing at us. And then we got good enough to dodge them, and then we could go kill the SAM site. Because when the SAMs fired, they kicked up all that dust on the ground. And so we go down with our CBUs or bombs or our guns, and we could destroy all that radar equipment. And uh, if there are any SAM sites or SAMs still stored there, they're thin-skinned, and the, the type of ordnance we had, we could we could destroy a lot of SAM sites that way. But it was a touch-and-go game to uh, coax them into firing at you and then go destroy. Them. Well, we were uh, we were always first in. We'd we'd rail refuel and then we'd lead the gaggle in, and our job was to cover, stay in there until the last flight was out to suppress the SAMs. So whereas the strike pilots coming in, they had a fixed target. They would come here, 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 drop their bombs, and they'd be time over target, TOT, maybe two minutes. We'd be trolling around in there for maybe 20 minutes. And in the uh, summertime, as long as in the wintertime, when the, well, the dry season, because we had to wait till the dust cleared, because McNamara would say, if you destroyed the target, you can't put another flight of bombs on there or another flight in bug. So if it took longer for the dust to clear in dry season. So there were times when we couldn't even use our afterburner in order to cover that last flight, because there'd be like five minutes between them. So it was just it was just a, a statistical uh, analysis that if you know, someone's over the target for two minutes versus 20 minutes, the odds of being shot down are about 10 times greater if you were just hanging around in there. And that was our mission. I had a friend in the, in the assignment branch of the Air Force. Everybody's got a buddy that's gonna look. And I told him, I said, Pete, the only job I don't want is a wild weasel job. And I was off getting a master's degree at University of Southern California, the bootstrap program. And most of the people of my qualifications had already gone. And I came back, and the day I walked in, the phone rang, and they said, tell Thorson he's got a weasel assignment. <laughs> and so uh, uh, it was not my first choice, but there's no question. It's the most challenging job I've ever had. And I, I've talked about the, the exhilaration of flying a mission well, and you won and coming back across the fence, as we call the McKen River. But it was not my first choice of a job, but uh, I, I had this, I had the experience and the skills. It was appropriate that I should be assigned to that job. I don't know if it's normally a volunteer position or not, but I was assigned to it. And um, I, I, think, I think most times it was, is at least by the time I went over there, I don't think it was voluntary anymore. They looked at the records of the people they had, and they said, here's a guy with so many flying hours, and he's got a lot of experience and so on. So plug him into the weasel because it had a more of a, more of a challenge to it. I believe to do the job well, you had to be um, kind of on the edge of being a fighter pilot. But I'm not saying I'm not saying the average pilot couldn't do it. But I think skill wise, but I think the motivation to do it and to hang it out, there was some some truth to that. The other side of it is we were viewed as just about loony because when I got to Tak Lee, Thailand, in 1966, I said I'm here uh, as a wild weasel and I'm checking into the base and they said well why should we assign you housing we'll get you a spot up on hill no no you're not gonna last you know you'd be good because the, the first five weasel crews to get to talk lee were all shut down in 45 days and i come prancing in thinking i'm a pretty good guy now i you know i'm a good pilot and i got all this equipment we'll save you and they the squadron commander the scheduling people would give us the weakest pilot to fly with because there was not much doubt in their mind they were going to lose us so why risk a good pilot on my wing or I was there, but, and so I finally asked uh, for, I said, give me some young lieutenants and uh, put them on my wing. And, and uh, as soon as we, for, on the very first mission, we get up there and even before we're out of the, the, the high threat area, I called number four and I said, take us home. Well, wingman never gets to see anything, but you know, the wing hanging on. And all of a sudden he said, where, you know, and they were given some leadership roles up there. And pretty soon I had a lot of lieutenants that wanted to fly with me, but it was, uh, it was a hairy job. We came in. They did not expect us to last. They didn't. 45, uh, 45 days and every, everything was wiped out, all five airplanes. Uh, and so they wondered if we were really worth losing one of their pilots as well as us. Uh, so we had to reprove or prove that the fact is we could save, save some of their airplanes rather than wasting some of their airplanes. Most fighter pilots, I think, uh, like to have a challenge and you're sort of out there on the edge. But... Um, there were times when, if, if someone wasn't didn't have high anxiety, you're you're abnormal. But the, if you go a little bit further, all of a sudden it's fear, and then fear starts controlling you. And there were times that you got very close to that edge of, I don't know if you should say lose it, 
but it was a very high anxiety level. And uh, the joke was, you tell the first weasel when he came in for, on a first mission, went, look, your mouth's going to get real dry, so chew gum. Well, <laughs> of course, your mouth does get dry and the gum starts to stick into your teeth. And then that's the big joke, you know, when you get back that night. But it was a very, uh, you know, the odds of coming out were not great. So I think the way you dealt with it is, is you just were so busy and there was so much activity going on that you didn't really have time to dwell on. I wonder if this is my last mission. I wonder if I'll get shot down. You're in there. You got all these different signals coming into you. You got a backseater, your EWO, and you're talking between yourself and you're listening to the different strike flights. You're listening to the the uh, electronic people warn about MIGs are taking off in a certain area. And I got to the point, instead of keeping a flight of four, I'd split us up and we'd go put two airplanes on each side and kind of a pincher movement. Uh, and there was just more to do and more going on than what you could just about keep up with. And you were just so busy, uh, time went by, and all of a sudden that last flight was in, and you, you were very aware who that last flight was going to be, and then you were out of there as fast as you could get out of there. Uh, before going on a mission, we'd be in the PE room, personal equipment, put it in our parachute and our G-suits and so on, and our lockers were there, and uh, it, it was... It happened every so often. Somebody would ask me as a weasel guy, because our odds are coming back or less, and he'd say, Leo, if you don't make it, can I have your locker? Uh, and it, you kind of joke about shot down, death, prisoner. And uh, the, in a way, it's respect for the mission. And in a way, it's just trying to add some levity, you know, some some lightness. Some it's a, it's a serious business. And whatever humor you can put into it is useful. I've never used drugs, but they talk about the high and you're addicted to that. Well, I was not addicted to the high that you got coming out, but I'll tell you, it was, it was a very high feeling when you crossed the Mekong River, coming out of Laos, you're in the, over Thailand, you're safe. You're over the good guy territory. And it, was, it really was an exhilaration to have really you beat death that day. And many days you saw people get shot down. So it's just, it's very, it's, there in your mind all the time, but it's usually, well, it won't happen to me. It's the other guy. And uh, the next day you go home and after you get back, you look at the schedule for tomorrow. If you're on it, you start getting your, your target out and you start studying the photographs of it and you prepare and you go home and you're dead tired and you sleep and the alarm goes off. It's right by a year and you get in your bicycle, you ride back down and you're in another briefing and you're ready to go. And then you get your head out, you put another tick on there and you're looking for a hundred of them. Uh, and it's just, you went from, from one high to the other, so to speak. I, 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 maybe I'm overplaying that, but it was an exhilarating feel to have cheated death, so to speak. First, it was very tough uh, to see a friend of yours, to see the airplane just blown apart, or maybe worse yet, to see, it floating, see him floating down in that parachute knowing he's going to be captured. That was, I guess the biggest fear of most of us was being captured, taking prisoner of war. If the airplane took a direct hit and it, got, it just blew apart, it was over like that. And that was easier to contemplate than spending years in a prison camp. Uh, the way you dealt with it, again, you just tried to be uh, do the best job you could. My goal was not to lose a wingman, and I made it through over 50 missions before a wingman was shot down. And uh, that was a devastating night to think that there were two guys, as a other well, weasel airplane, sitting in a prison camp if they lived. Uh, and you, you didn't dwell on it. Again, maybe the fact that we were so busy and our mission was so challenging that we didn't have time to dwell on those kinds of things. You had another mission to fly tomorrow, and there were 20 guys. If there were, if there were five flights of four, that's uh, one guy per airplane. There's 20 guys depending on you to eliminate that, that surface air missile threat and hope that somebody else takes care of the MiGs and the flag. I, as a weasel pilot, didn't consider it a suicide mission, but I knew the odds of my finishing 100 missions to go home were significantly less than a guy carrying a well, strike pilot where he was over the target area so much less. Uh, it, we used a lot of kind of tough slang in the military while you're flying pilots, and uh, I don't use now, but uh, an example of what you're saying, the respect or the reputation we had, uh, my backseater, Harry Johnson, and I were on R&R &R &R one day in the Philippines for a couple of days, and we were getting back on a tanker to come back and go flying tomorrow, and my backseater, an EWO, was talking to a B-52 EWO, talking their same equal language, I guess. And so my backseater said, well, I'm a weasel. I lose my pilot and we're a weasel crew. And the B-52 guys got kind of big. The, the other we he won't. He said, well, where's your extra bag? And Harry said, what do you mean? He said, where, where do you carry your balls? 
uh, just there was you know, a very indirect way or uh, kind of a slang way of saying, I have very high regard for you guys that'll hang it out like that day after day uh, and, you know, and knowing what the odds are. I had never flown with a crew member before, fighter pilot, single place airplane, and all of a sudden I got this crew I got to coordinate with. But Harry turned out to be, a, he was a frustrated fighter pilot, I think. He was a great Ewell, and I taught him how to fly. There was a stick in the back seat of a 105. So we'd go up to the tankers, I'd carry pictures of the suspected SAM sites with me, I'd plug in, we'd get our fuel, and we'd wait for all the, all the strike people. And I was studying those photographs, so right up to the last minute, and then I'd fly. Uh, but Harry was uh, only one time out of 92 missions to he question my judgment. And we were out of the Delta by herself, uh, trying to get a SAM site. And he said, Leo, we're hanging it out kind of far. And uh, because he was so hesitant to criticize my portion, of the, my job, my portion of the crew, uh, I paid a lot of attention to him. But Harry was just a, we, we somehow we ended up being very well matched. We were both aggressive and we both realized at some point you're better off to back out, come back tomorrow rather than going to the point where you're just about certain to be shot down. But uh, we'd, it'd be in the heat of things going on. And Harry had about three eyes. Harry twice saved my butt, our butt, because he saw MIGs coming in that I hadn't, wasn't aware of there. And yet he's looking at the scope. He's listening to all that stuff. He's tuning his knobs. And I don't know how he put, maybe all navigators are cross-eyed. But, but Harry, Harry seemed to be able to look in two spots at two times, and he could listen to about three different radio signals and, and stay on top of it all. So without Harry, uh, I would have been shot down. We would have been shot down long before we were. The day I was shot down, I was supposed to be on a bow and arrow tiger hunt. I had an R&R, &R and I was going to go down to Saigon on a, on a bus and taxi, up the River Kwai on a, on a boat, uh, on an elephant inn, and uh, close to Burma. And uh, I was getting, had get home itis, so I canceled my R&Rs I'd saved up to them and said, I want to get my quick, my last eight missions in real soon so I can be at home by Mother's Day. And uh, it took several Mother's Day, and, and I didn't even see a tiger over there. I had just turned over a mountain peak, and I was on my final heading, and I had one more checkpoint right under my nose, and as soon as I got to that point, I knew where that SAM site was up there was occupied, and I'd accelerated up to my launch speed, and I was just getting ready to, uh, I was probably a minute before I launched the Shrike, uh, which homes in on radar, and all of a sudden, uh, we got a air-to-air -air warning system. And so I said to Harry, my backseater, I said, you got air to air back there? He's got more sophisticated technology. And he said, yeah. And I, so I quickly jumped in the radio and I called the MIG cap flight, which are a flight of F-4s, which would be the second flight, eight, 10 miles back and said, are you painting me? Is it, I want to know if it was their air to air, it was a MIG. And they said, yeah, we're in trail with you about 10 miles, no sweat. Well, they never answered my question. It was a little like, well, they never asked him to answer my question directly. And, uh, but I assumed it was the way they answered, yeah, no sweat, we're about eight or 10 miles in trail with you. What happened is I turned over that mountain peak, here's a valley down there, and there were two MIGs down there orbiting, and it just so happened when we turned over, they rolled out of a turn, they looked up, and voila, there we sat. And uh, they couldn't keep up with this. Everything was just perfect for them that day. And they both hosed off a sidewinder at I and my wingman, and uh, I did absolutely nothing as that sidewinder was about to me because I knew it was the F-4s, air to air, not a MIG air. -to -air. And so we just blew out, both my wingman and I, they went right up our tailpipes. And uh, so they, they two, two airplanes just like that and three, three people, my backseat and the other one was a single airplane. So it was, it was very frustrating in that I'd been over there in 92, I was on my 93rd mission and I'd evaded so much stuff and I'd shot down a couple of MIGs and I'd been... You know, I had a lot of experience, and I did absolutely nothing. I just sat there like a duck, you know, shooting out of, out of a barrel uh, because of the, well, because of the intelligence I just received. I, I felt safe, and I wasn't, obviously. Harry and I had briefed many times. If we ever took a, a direct hit, that we would eject no matter what our airspeed because we'd seen airplanes hit, and the guy, we thought, tried to stay with it till he slowed down, get out safer, and the airplane came apart or he never made it out. So we'd briefed many times, and I said, Harry, if I ever say the word go, and, and you'll know the context, don't, don't question it, you just pull that ejection trigger, and I'll be right behind you, because the back seat's supposed to go before the front seat, because you'll burn him with your rocket if, you're, if he's got his canopy up. And when we took this severe hit, it felt like somebody hit the airplane with a big sledgehammer. The controls were instantly gone, the cockpit was full of smoke, I put my, my visor right against the side of the cockpit, I couldn't see out, it was so thick, and I was starting to feel smoke in my lungs. And the airplane was unwinding and starting to do gyrations. And that took a lot longer to say than what the decision to say, go. Harry said, shit, and went. 
and I heard the rush of sound, and then I went right after him, and we were probably, uh, and we were doing uh, 600 knots, 675 miles an hour, and about 525 is the fastest you're supposed to be able to escape without energy. And both of us had some minor injuries, uh, Harry's, our backs, but my legs went straight sideways at my knees when I hit the airstream. And so both of the inside knees were torn up badly, but the system worked. Uh, we got out of the airplane. And uh, we were floating down, and the thought there were two thoughts that went through my mind, and I don't know why, and I hadn't thought about that. I'd think about it, but one was it went, went over and over and over. Leo, you're going to make it. Leo, you're going to make it. And it was a very comforting thought. The second one was, how will my family take it? You know, I had a wife and a daughter, and I was close to getting home, and we had kind of get home itis, and they were we knew about when I'd finished my hundred missions. Uh, but yeah, that was uh, that was frightening. I, I looked down and. Uh, there was a pretty good wind, so it was drifting across the jungle, but maybe 2,000, 3,000 feet below me was a, were the trees, and there was an opening. And I saw a muzzle flashes, a rifle flash, shooting at me in my parachute, and it's hard to hide in a parachute. Uh, but uh, they were lousy shots, and I was moving across. But that was very, uh, the apprehension. Some people are killed when they're picked up. Um, some people were skinned alive, I know. That's the fear of becoming a POW. And um, that was not a good day. Uh, I couldn't walk when I got on the ground. My tree hung, my parachute hung up a tree. I finally had a rope with me, a lanyard, and I got down. But I couldn't walk because my knees were out. So I was crawling up this mountain, and uh, I knew there were rescue airplanes en route. And uh, about 10 minutes after I was captured, they were overhead, but that was too late. But there were probably 20 young guys, all young males. Uh, a couple of them had real rifles and old rifles. Some of them had wooden training rifles, I assume. They all had machetes. And uh, they caught up with me as I was crawling uphill up the mountain. And first thing they did was uh, cut my clothes off. And they'd never seen a zipper. These were in the, in the mountains, the tribes. And uh, even my boots had zippers on, but they were very good using machetes. And they didn't care if they nicked you a little. So I ended up with, you know, pretty well bloodied up with a, in a set of underwear. And then uh, they kind of sat me down. And I'll never forget this feeling. They put a kind of like a pillowcase, a bag over my head. And just as that was happening, I saw the man, the young fellow in front of me, he had a machete. And he was pulling it back, and it was pointed right towards my stomach. There was no question in my mind that was the end of it. And the thought that went through my mind is, I wonder if my family will ever find out how I died. Um, but uh, he didn't. And um, they carried me in a net because I couldn't walk. And uh, we made it down to the flatlands. And we spent a night and a day there because they didn't travel with trucks at night or during the daytime, because my buddies were bombing them, and Harry and I were both interrogated literally in a pig pen that first day, and I got by with name, rank, serum, date of birth, like you're supposed to. Uh, I thought, I can handle it. Uh, it was kind of tough when you're knocked around, the pig pen and the manure and so on, but uh, uh, it, that was just the beginning. It wasn't six years of hell, of well, being without your freedom is, but three years from my time, I was there about six years. Three years were brutal. Torture was normal. Three years were boring. Torture was abnormal. Uh, Ho Chi Minh died. Uh, the wives, the families started the campaign, letter, letter, you know, the bracelets. Hanoi released my father, bumper stickers and billboards. And they finally realized that we were expected to come home alive. That was after about three years and treatment got some, quite a bit better. We lived in big cells. We got to talk out loud. Uh, and uh, then it was a matter of waiting it out rather than wondering if you'd survive because of brutality and being shot or something. Um, the first three years, um, I uh, am not a preacher, but I would gladly say that uh, I wasn't strong enough to have made it on my own. I had some help from outside faith. I'm a Christian. Was before, uh, became more so there. My back backseater, Harry Johnson, was, I don't think he was sure if he's an atheist or an agnostic, but uh, there are very few uh, of those, very few atheists in prison camps. And uh, he became a pretty devout Christian. And uh, but most of us would admit that we needed some additional help and some strength. And that you know there were times you uh, there were times uh, when uh, you uh, you'd pray, you could pass out, or you know uh, try to get through the next. It wasn't always the next day. Sometimes it was the next hour, next minute, next few seconds. And it was pretty brutal for for some time. Beatings, torture, shoulders being pulled out of sockets because they got your shoulder. Your, your, Elbows strapped behind you with wire, and they're with their foot up, they're pulling it, and they'll pop a shoulder or hanging you upside down by shackles on your feet, and uh, a bar through it, and hanging you in room 18 or one of those cells. Uh, there's a hookup in the ceiling and beating you till you passed out. It was, yeah, it was very difficult. 
The day we were released, we all got on a bus. I had been sick. I was living by myself. I hoped they wouldn't forget me. I had kind of a malaria stuff, and I'd had a hepatitis while I was there. And uh, they didn't forget me, and I got my shoes and pants and jacket like everybody else. Got on the airplane and uh, walked out to Hanoi. They gave us a warm beer. Uh, the Vietnamese did as uh, so we uh, got into kind of a little terminal. And then we went out to the tarmac and the C-141 was sitting out there, a beautiful airplane. And uh, there was a colonel, was a ranking American person and an equal rank Vietnamese. And they called off our name. We stood in formation and we marched forward. We saluted the Air Force colonel and they turned control of, of us from the Vietnamese to them. Uh, they hustled us out to the airplane and we all had escorts. We were met in the, in the back of the airplane. The big ramp was down by the best looking nurses in the whole world. And they all gave us a kiss and put us on the airplane. And, uh, and we took off for Clark and there was no emotion when we left the prison. There was no outward emotion uh, as we drove through, uh, Hanoi and looked to where the bombing craters were and so on, or on the ramp. There, there was no emotion until the airplane broke ground. And we, we'd been expecting to go home for so long and little things would come along. We say, I wonder if this is going to be that we no longer allowed ourselves to become emotional. We, we kept a very level keel for several years at the end. And, uh, but when that airplane broke ground, we truly believed we were on our way to freedom and it just, it just exploded. And there was hugging and, you know, just, uh, every type of uh, emotion that mostly is physical. And I was uh, still somewhat sick. And then we stopped at Clark air base, had some interrogation, put us back in the airplane. I was sicker by then, and I was the only POW taken off the airplane in Hawaii coming home because I'd, I I asked them to put some ice on me. I was taking my own temperature in a litter. It was 102, I had 103, 104, 105, and they packed me down. And I said, I'm not going to expire now. I, I'm, I've gone through too much. So I got to Clark. They flew me up to General Tripler Hospital, and I couldn't believe it. I was solitary in a big wing up there. I, <laughs> I was in solitary confinement because uh, uh, they had a wing preserved for the POWs or reserved, and I was the only one. But I got to finish this story because it's it, it just stirs a, a soft spot in my heart. Uh, I called my wife, and they got my temperature down some, and they said, "If you know, if you can walk, you can get on this airplane. We'll get you back to St. Louis where your wife's waiting for you." Now, so we got in this 141, and I was the only prisoner. And, uh, and uh, we got on there and, uh, I had my own flight nurse surgeon. I had my own nurse, uh, medical team and a crew. But as we approached, uh, the West coast, San Francisco, we flew over San Francisco. They said, do you want to make a position report to uh, flight control up there? And the, our homecoming call sign is seven. So I said, you bet. And so I said, uh, homecoming, uh, you know, San Francisco uh, center, this is homecoming seven. Uh, you know, we're uh, 200 miles out uh, directions, please. Or, you know, instructions, please. And they played Don't Fence Me In over the radio. It was midnight or so. It was dark. But you could see the horizon lights up there. And, uh, and then they said, uh, welcome home. Welcome home. And the thought that went through my mind, I'm a Minnesota farm kid. And here I was. I had my own airliner. And they said, you have presidential clearance for your present position in direct St. Louis. And I thought, being home is going to be okay. It's going to meet all those expectations that we've been dreaming about. So, but I was, I was impressed. With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Level up with Gourmet Plus options, prepared to perfection by chefs and ready-to-eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. Looking for calorie-conscious options? Try delicious, dietitian approved calorie-smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. Need an extra boost to support your wellness goals and feel your best as you tackle a busy autumn? Try Protein Plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. With Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. We offset 100% of our delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for our production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in our meals. This September, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash warriors50 and use code warriors50 to get 50% off. That's code warriors50 
at factormeals.com slash warriors50 to get 50% off. I'm Elise Hugh. And I'm Josh Klein. And we're the hosts of Built for Change, a podcast from Accenture. On Built for Change, we're talking to business leaders from every corner of the world that are harnessing change to reinvent the future of their business. We're discussing ideas like the importance of ethical AI or how productivity soars when companies truly listen to what their employees value. These are insights that leaders need to know to stay ahead. So subscribe to Built for Change wherever you get your podcasts. I received the Medal of Honor because I was trying to rescue my, my downed wingman, direct the rescue operation. Most Medals of Honor are given, you know, not because you kill a lot of people, but because you're saving your buddy or something. And in my case, uh, my wingman had been shot down, and there were two of them in the airplane. And uh, a, a MiG started attacking the two guys floating down the airplane. So I attacked that MiG and ended up shooting that MiG down. And then about that time, some MiGs were on our tail. And... We escaped out of there, low level, supersonic on the deck through valleys and uh, came back around one more time and was trying to make radio contact with these, my, my wingmen on the, on the radio, their little handheld radio, and started to make that contact and we were out of fuel. So we went to some distance out, found an air refueling tanker. While we're on the tanker, I'm saying, I need some help. We're going back in. I need a flight with me. Well, there's always mix-ups. So it turned out there was nobody available to go with me. And that just, that's how things happen sometimes ago. So Harry and I, and our one, we had a little bit of ammo left, and that's about all. We went back in by ourselves, and just about the time we got over where the, my wingmen were, we by ourselves surrounded five MiGs, and uh, they were all in the, in the circle up there. And I just happened to fly in the middle of it and uh, hosed away with the last fuel I had on another one up there, and he pieces started coming off. But by that time, there were more of them on us, and we uh, one more time back through the valleys and uh, finally got away from them. And finally, another flight came in. And so they took over the rescue operation. I was close to a tanker and the, uh, all of a sudden over the radio, and you, you never use first names over the radio. I heard this voice that said, Leo. I said, you know, Tomahawk 3 here, yes, or whatever it is, Lee. He said, I got 600 pounds. I don't know where I am and I'm about to eject. So I called my tanker. I put him on the same channel and I said, tanker, you come further north and home in on this guy. And I'll, I'll, Harry and I will try to make it to to Thailand on the field we got. And uh, this guy, I know his name, and he somehow, he hooked up with zero indication remaining, uh, coasting downhill. He hooked in the tanker and they saved that one. And then we climbed to uh, 35,000 feet and an Air 105 will, will glide two miles per thousand. So when we were 70 miles out, indicating about zero, pulled it back to idle and started gliding and we ran out of fuel just after we touched down uh, in Thailand. So it was just a mission that lasted a long time, a couple of refuelings in there and we probably should not have survived it, but you don't think, you know, uh, will I be rewarded, Willis? Uh, some people say you should have been criticized for it because the odds of being shot down are great. It was just my job. I mean, he was my wingman. There was no question that my job was to go in there and direct that operation. And if and if things fell apart and I was the only one there, then I was the only one there. But uh, there were a couple Sandy airplanes coming up, you know, rescue airplanes coming up there. Uh, and while we were there, uh, as I was coming back in after refueling, Sandy two call said, Sandy one's going in, Sandy one's going in. The MIGs are on these little propeller recepts airplane. And he said, and he kind of said, what should I do in essence? And I said, keep turning your airplane as hard as you can turn it. They can't stay with you and keep talking and I'll home in on you. And so he kept talking and I, I just used my automatic direction find, homed in on him and went right through those MIGs. And they did what I hoped they would. They followed me and he got away. But they're going through the mind is you have a job to do. And that's, that's all there's to it. There's no question of, should I or shouldn't I, when somebody's hurting, uh, he's your wingman. I was proud and I was humble and I'd read medals of honor citations uh, before I went to the White House. So I knew what kind of men uh, I was going to join in this society. But I found out in, with a tap code in prison that I'd been submitted for the Medal of Honor. Uh, I was shot down 11 days after I was, this mission I flew that I late, later got the Medal of Honor. 11 days later, I was shot down. But uh, someone came into the squadron about that time, and he was tasked to write this Medal of Honor citation. Then he was shot down. So he was aware of this. And so with the TAP code, about maybe a year or a year and a half after I was there, I found out that I'd been submitted for the Medal of Honor. And I came home uh, 
after six years of being there, uh, nothing was in my records about that. And it was just a, it was blank for that day. And I looked at my back seaters records and he would received the air force cross, which is the next, oops, next medal. And, uh, he kind of gave me a hard time about that, but he said, you know, there's something going on here. So at any rate, I uh, was contacted by the air force and said that, uh, I'd been for submitted for a medal of honor, but it's going back through channels. And I said, why is that? And they didn't really answer it. But the reason it was, is we had seven people as prisoners of war who collaborated. And so, difficult thing to say because Americans should, but we had seven Americans who collaborated and they, the Air Force, even though the Medal of Honor wasn't for prison time, they wanted to find, they didn't want to be embarrassed by awarding someone. So it went back to the system and it took another nine months or so. So I think I'm the only Medal of Honor recipient that has been approved by two administrations, two presidents and all that. My wife who's Swedish thinks it's because I'm Norwegian. She couldn't know and all that. <laughs> Developing this tactic was a fun thing because it was one of the things we, we kind of won. Uh, and what all it was is our strike missile could go about seven miles. The surface air missile shooting at us could go 17. They could, they could kill us in that 10 mile range and we couldn't touch them. And it was very frustrating. So one day we were coming back from a mission. We had a little extra fuel. And I said to Harry, uh, let's see how high we can go, how fast we can go at it, and we get up at altitude. And then let's see if we can, how, how far we can pull the nose up. And, and maybe we could lob these shrikes somewhere in there. So we did that. We accelerated. We, we got up to about 35,000 feet, about 1.3 Mach with all the paint and the pylons, but we get that. And so then I said, oh, here we, here we go, Harry. And I said, if I had two strikes, I'd launch one at 40 and one at 50 degrees, you know, 45 is optimum. And I was able to get through 50 degrees before I kind of started stalling out and rolled it off the wing. So we, we knew how much we could do there. So I, I wrote a letter uh, back to the uh, Fighter Weapons School at Nellis Air Force Base. And I said, if I were to launch a strike, uh, starting at 35,000 feet at Mach 1.3 and I'm down to whatever the airspeed was and I launched it, one at 40, one at 50, how far would it go? What would happen to it? And they said, well, it would go out there a long way, and then it, it wouldn't start homing and using up its homing until it got down below 18,000 feet. That was just part of the criteria of the missile. And uh, you, could probably, uh, you could probably hit something 35 miles away. And we smiled big, and we said, well, let's do it. So I wrote a letter to the Air Force down at Saigon, and I said, here's what we can do. Frag us, you know, order us to go out and do this. And I said, ideally, we'd have the strike people coming down with some weasels, from the north into Hanoi, and we'll come in from the southeast, and we'll back off 35,000 miles from all the SAMs in there. And uh, I think we can do a lot of damage, and we're, we can, this, this is really going to get them. So they sent, they sent four of us up. One of them couldn't get rid of his drop tanks. So uh, he aborted, but they had three of us, and we launched just before the 105s at Flight of 20 was coming down, those four flights, five flights. And we pulled up, and we spread, I spread them 10 degrees, and we launched one at 40 and one at 50. And sure enough, we lobbed them right into the Hanoi area. And they had B-66s, Elant airplane out there to figure out how effective we were. And they came back and they said, we killed five SAM sites, the, the radars, which are their control part, with six strikes. I mean, it was a phenomenal success. And they didn't know what hit them. And a little bit more to that then. Uh, that was viewed as being so good. Air Force down the and said, do it again tomorrow. So we were taxiing out the next day, and they, they said, abort the mission, abort the mission. So we came back in and said, what went on? Well, I had a friend working in Saigon, and this is unofficial, but I know it happened. General Momar was down there, and I'm told he just about got fired because the Russians launched a protest to the, to the ICC, the International Control Commission, like this wasn't fair. Because what happened is that in the Chinese embassy in Hanoi, they had a fan song, a radar sitting on top of their embassy to control some of the sands right there. And we wiped it out and we killed two Russian technicians. And this is another rule of engagement that wasn't fair. We, uh, so that was the last mission we ever flew like that into that area. Uh, but the system worked. And from then on, we used it, uh, they used it. I was shot down not too long after this. There's one other aspect to that story. Um, Bob Wagoner was a POW, a good friend of mine that I learned to be a friend in, in Hanoi. In fact, I saw him yesterday. And he's a bigger guy, he's a Steamboat Springs, just a neat guy. He was a prisoner, and he had carried a Shrike checklist in his G-suit pocket, and his name was on the checklist when he was captured. So that night, the night of that mission, we flew, and we all of a sudden figured out how to throw these things 35 miles and outgun them. They pulled back Bob Wagoner out of his cell and just beat hell out of him to have them tell him, have him tell them <laughs> how we did this. Well, about six months later, I moved into a cell with Bob Wagner. And I'm kind of proud of this. And I'm telling Bob the story. And all of a sudden, his eyes started getting bigger and bigger. And he's a big guy. <laughs> and I could see anger building in his face. Well, it was thanks to my maneuvers, you know, Bob had been tortured one night. 
And so <laughs> he can smile about it now, but I was real, I, I kind of was, I tiptoed around that cell for, for, for a few days. And, uh, but it was, it was, it was fun to be able to do something brand new and never been done. And I think anybody would feel good about whatever they did uh, that's new and successful. Yes, there is a fighter pilot mentality. And, and, and I think it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. That's not the distinction. It's your, your, what excites you. The type of challenges one likes. Uh, somebody might like to get their PhD and go off and research medicine. Uh, I I wanted to be a fighter pilot and live on the edge, kind of, and uh, pull a lot of G's and go fast and be close to the ground and see the world zip by at supersonic speeds. Uh, there's I don't think the word is thrill, but there's just a um, why are people become race drivers. I think most race drivers at Indy would probably make good fighter pilots. That type of mentality where they they seek out those sorts of those sorts of, of, of excitement, I think. And uh, I've always said being a fighter pilot is like somebody giving you a brand new Porsche and a tank of gas and said, you know, go see how fast it'll go and go test it. Uh, it's, just, it's just a wonderful job. I guess that was a high point when I, when I engaged Megs in one. Uh, certainly my low point was when Meg engaged me and I didn't even know he was there and, and I lost and got shot down and became a prisoner. But the, uh, the, elation, the, the feel of but I learned enough to split my mission up, and I was the only weasel, I think, that did that to start with and figured out how to cover a lot of, how to suppress a lot of SAM sites and let the strike people do their job. Uh, and hang in there, you go first in, you're last out, and people have a high regard for that, and you do it. And you do it with great degree of danger, but you fulfill your mission, and you're coming across that Mekong River. I just can't tell you what a wonderful feeling that is to feel that you want another one. You're going to put another tick on your head and you're that much closer to going home and you go back and you go in the bar and uh, you can tell when people are very grateful and they really appreciate the, the mission you did for them, the job you did for them. And it wasn't just from us to them. We were all in it together, but it was a unique job and it was the first time in war we'd ever had such a thing. And it was, uh, it, it was a thrilling job. Well, I suppose it helped to be one who appreciates living on the edge. I think if you'd been an old fighter, uh, bomber pilot that got stuck into that job and you really hadn't been rolling on your back a lot as a young guy and, and had a lot of training where you pull a lot of Gs and you're kind of uh, flying high-performance airplanes, you'd be flying, you know, tankers. Uh, I think that meant that type of personality would not have done a good a job at Weasling. Because while you're trolling around up there, the people flying the iron, flying the... Uh, with the iron bombs trying to hit that POL site. They know how far that POL site is from this, this bend in the river. It's two miles, and they're going to be two miles up. They want a 45 degrees, so they, they, can, they can plan out, and they know exactly where, what their dive, dive angle will be, and they can release them. But in Stroller, all of a sudden, you're up here, and something of Sam launches back here. First, you got to evade that, and then you're maybe up to 3,000 feet, and you may end up at 20,000 feet. And now you got to figure out how to position that airplane with enough airspeed, dive angle, and altitude, and when to release the bomb to hit that site. There's nothing pre-planned. It's all, you know, experience. So it is um, someone who thinks, uh, I guess, in three dimensions that makes a good fighter pilot and could handle that weasel job pretty well rather than having everything programmed out for them. I think the legacy of this legacy of, of the wild weasels will be that there was a span of time in there during Vietnam era where uh, our opponents developed a surface-to-air missile, first time ever used, it was capable of shooting down an airplane. So we had to come up with a counter system, and i.e. the wild weasels, um, put some anti-radar missiles on there and put a crew together to try to, try to, uh, to destroy those SAM sites. And uh, it was a dangerous job. It was a challenging job. It was a job that was pretty well done. And as technology and time went on, uh, now... We're, we may be, we're past that stage where there's other, other countermeasures against surface to air missiles. But we fill that void, that gap of how do we protect other airplanes from doing their traditional job as, you know, interdiction and so on by the use of wild weasels. And it was an exciting period in our, in our time. And I think it'll live for a while that uh, I hope it's the crews are received uh, respect for hanging it out as much as they did, knowing, the, knowing their odds. And also the system was developed as a, as a mark of excellence on our, our industrial complex. I didn't question my mission to, I was ordered to go in and do it. And I, I don't think I questioned it for uh, several things. One is uh, I've been trained to do it. I was a professional fighter pilot and 
I was at the top of my career. My flying was good. I was recognized as such, and they picked those people to be weasels. And I suppose I had a certain amount of pride in that. Also, when we went to Vietnam, the war wasn't really, uh, uh, the anti-war thing hadn't started out yet. I went over there in 66. And um, I think another thing is I would have been embarrassed not to. Everybody was doing their job to the best they could, with rare exceptions. And had I all of a sudden one day said, I don't think I believe in this cause, I guess I won't go. I think just pride would have prevented me from saying that. So maybe it was foolish pride, maybe it was youth pride, even though I was old at the time. But uh, young people don't seem to question their government. I grew up in a patriotic home, and I was fighting my gut. I was, I was red, white, and blue when I went over there. And I would just add, surprisingly, maybe to most people, I came home, I think I was more red, white, and blue. And that was simply because I'd had a chance to look at communism from within the very bowels of the system for six years. And, you know, there's a lot of things wrong with our country, but it's all relative. When you compare it to, you know, uh, that dictatorial, no freedom, autocratic system, uh, I was so proud to be an American. And we came home, uh, I'm rambling, but we came home to a country that was much less red, white, and blue. We came home to a country that didn't, had lost confidence in our institutions, our just about our family, our religion, our government, our military, our school system even. And it was a difficult adjustment. We came home so proud to be Americans, to a, an America that was so much, what's the opposite of less proud, you know, or so, so against our country, so much less proud than when we left. So it was, it was quite an adjustment for us when we came home. There was no question in my mind what communism was. I'd, I'd been a fighter pilot during the Cold War. I sat in Germany with nuclear weapons strapped to the bottom with targets in Russia. And this was just sort of an extension of that. And now the communists were trying to go down and capture Thailand, which is the breadbasket for them. And uh, we'd, our government had made the decision for us to be involved. Uh, and even then, we knew it was a little shaky. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, was that a good enough reason to get involved? And But Kennedy had put arms people in and Johnson built it up. And there we were. So I didn't really question if I should, that I was following legal orders or all lawful orders, I was. I was performing the job I'd been asked to do and was somewhat proud to do it, even though I, I was totally disgusted with the fact we fought with one arm tied behind our back. And a couple examples, Ho Chi Minh had a summer palace. We couldn't, in the mountains, in, we, we knew what we couldn't fly within 10 miles of it. Uh, if a MiG was attacking us and we got into a battle and the MiG was within 25 miles of the Chinese border, we had to back off because of fear of you know, inciting the Chinese to be more involved. The most frustrating thing was day after day, uh, northwest of Hanoi, there was a base called Fukien, one of the major MiG bases. We could see them parked down there in the revetments. We could see them taxiing out. We could see them taking off, and we couldn't touch them until they were airborne. And uh, that, was, that was just ludicrous. I, it took a week of briefing for me to find out what we couldn't do over North Vietnam in combat, in fighting combat. That was... No, it, it was a dumb, poorly run war. Was it worth it? Uh, at the time, it was. In hindsight, what I know now, it wasn't. But I, the, the bigger answer is the war, I don't think was worth it. We probably should not have fought that war. I don't think we should have been there. We didn't have a good reason for being there. And then we made all those mistakes during the war and so on. So in hindsight, which is always perfect, uh, no, it was not worth it. At the time we were doing it, uh, we felt we were doing the right thing. We were doing our job. There was a threat out there. They were shooting down airplanes out of the sky with surf jet missiles. We came up with a system to counter that. We went in and we destroyed a lot of SAM sites. And we made the job of our strike pilots a lot safer. From that respect, without question, it was worth it. That was Colonel Leo Thorsness. Thanks for listening to Warriors in Their Own Words. If you have any feedback, please email the team at kharbaugh at evergreenpodcasts.com. We're always looking to improve the show. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review. Warriors in Their Own Words is a production of Evergreen Podcasts in partnership with The Honor Project. Our producer is Declan Roars. Bridget Coyne is our production director, and Sean Rolhoffman is our audio engineer. Special thanks to Evergreen executive producers Joan Andrews, Michael DeAloya, and David Moss. I'm Ken Harbaugh, and this is Warriors in Their Own Words. This is Peter. And this is Tom. We want to tell you guys a little bit about our podcast. 
Tom and I met in college, became best friends, and then teachers almost 20 years ago. Sometimes school just does not allow us to elaborate on the topics that we find interesting, like the real shark attacks that inspired the movie Jaws, or the real historical context to Indiana Jones artifacts. Where does cereal come from? Or are zombies real? Does Ben Franklin really deserve to be on a hundred dollar bill? On our podcast, just like in our class, there are no stupid questions. Just two friends having lighthearted conversation about history, pop culture, and the context of current events. Listen to History Teachers Talking Podcast from Evergreen Network, anywhere you get your podcasts.